This is the power of divestment, moving big and small dollars for social change. I'm Ann Pernick. I'm with Stand.Earth. This webcast is part of our Campaign Stories Winning Strategies project, which we do with support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And uh, it's an opportunity to share lessons learned between activists. And we're so excited to have these four activists and all of you on the line today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody. And this is the order that we'll have everyone speak today. We have Matt Remley. He is a Hunkpapa Lakota, and he lives in Seattle and works for the Office of Indian Education in the Marysville Tualap School District. He is a writer and editor for Last Real Indians. He's the author of Seattle's Indigenous People's Day Resolution, Seattle's resolution calling on Congress to engage in reconciliation with tribes over the boarding school era policies, and Seattle's resolution to oppose the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. He recently organized Seattle's campaign to divest from Wells Fargo. In 2014, Matt was awarded Seattle's Individual Human Rights Leader Award. And Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Victoria Fernandez is a campaign strategist and coach with four years of climate movement experience. She has mentored and trained six student investment campaigns mostly in the University of California system to engage in increasingly escalatory direct action through her coordination of the Escalation Core program and through her staff role as a campaign coach at the Divestment Student Network. As a student, she ran the Fossil Free Cal campaign at UC Berkeley. The UC has since divested over $350 million from coal, tar sands, and a few Dakota Access Pipeline supporting campaigns. Originally from California, Victoria lives in York, and she's seeking to build the next generation of youth climate leaders through the Sunrise Movement. And welcome, Victoria. Jamie Trinkle founded the PDX Divestment Coalition and successfully led the coalition to win a socially responsible investing policy that includes people of color as decision makers and human rights impact investment criteria. And as of April 2017, an end to all corporate investing in Portland. She has published numerous organizing toolkits within LASE, including university toolkits that help students at Columbia and the University of California win prison divestment. Jamie began working against abusive prison conditions and for the targets of our criminal justice system while clerking at the Portland Law Collective as a law student. And welcome, Jamie. And we also have Richard Brooks. He is 350.org's iconic divestment campaign coordinator, supporting the organization's efforts to force iconic institutions such as New York's $350 billion pension funds and the Nobel Foundation to divest from fossil fuels. Richards holds a master's degree in forest conservation from the University of Toronto. He was the past coordinator of Greenpeace Canada's National Forest Campaign, where he led corporate campaigns on some of the world's largest brands and achieved lasting protection for ancient forests like the Great Bear Rainforest. And welcome, Richard. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And um, we're going to close down the webcams for everybody but Matt and let him begin. Each of our presenters is going to talk a little bit about um, the campaigns that they have worked on, just a few minutes, about five minutes each. And then um, I will bring everybody back and I will, I have a few questions to ask all um, the panelists and then we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A with our audience. So with that, give me just a mo moment to set up Matt and uh, we'll get going. All right, great, Matt. Thanks for your patience and take it away. Oh, and I'll, sorry, let me pull up your slides too. Okay, great. <clears throat> Mataki epi chante wa shte na pechu se palo, wa kiyo wanatana machia palo, ya wo slaha amataha yelo, ate waya gi Charles Rimley, ina waya gi Donna Harrison. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me on this uh, webcast today. And thank you, Anne, for the invitation to speak a little bit about uh, some of the efforts we've been involved with out in, uh, on the West Coast and in Seattle 
are around uh, divestment and specifically addressing uh, the cold access pipeline and uh, a number of the uh, tar sands pipelines. So, so thank you for having me. Um, just going to run through just some of the uh, steps and actions we've been taking out in Seattle. Um, you know, first, my, my involvement with the, uh, I'm from Standing Rock, I am Honkapapa Lakota, but live out in Seattle. Uh, my involvement with the code access pipeline and, and the opposition to it uh, began in uh, January 2016, uh, when family members who were still living in uh, Standing Rock reached out and asked to uh, for some support. And uh, via the, uh, at that time, um, there was not a lot of information going out about the, the pipeline. And as was mentioned in uh, my uh, intro that I edit and write for Last Real Indians. So we started documenting uh, the pipeline and that's kind of where my involvement uh, with DAPO began. In uh, August, uh, a, a group called Food and Water Watch, which is also based here in Seattle, they released a report that highlighted all the financial institutions that were um, banking on uh, the quota access pipeline. And uh, through that, we were able to see that, you know, um, who, who some of the top banks involved were and seeing that Wells Fargo was uh, one of the banks that was heavily invested into the pipeline and knowing that they are uh, who the city of Seattle banked through, I reached out to our Seattle City Council member, uh, Shama Sawant, to see if they would be willing to, to sponsor an ordinance to uh, divest the city, specifically its employee payroll account, uh, which was uh, a th is a $3 billion per year uh, account. Uh, she said, yes, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with council member Sawant on a, a number of other issues. She's, she's a pretty amazing lady. And so anyways, that, that kind of kicked off a, a multi-month uh, campaign of um, building a broad coalition of folks uh, to pass the ordinance. Uh, one thing we really wanted to do was highlight the fact that there are many reasons to divest from uh, Wells Fargo which included their uh, funding of the code access pipeline, but also highlighting the fact that they're involved in funding private prisons, detention centers and stuff like that. And uh, through that, we were able to build a, a kind of broad coalition of uh, community members to really push this uh, ordinance. And, um, you know, we were successful in February of getting uh, Seattle to divest to the tune of $3 billion. Um, with that though, we didn't want uh, that to be our one all be all uh, effort. So we began outreaching and working with other communities uh, who are interested in running similar campaigns in either their city and or tribe. And uh, we work with folks in San Francisco, LA, um, all, you know, all across the US and uh, throughout Europe and um, to lead a broader divestment campaign. And, um, you know, you've been seeing a number of cities uh, pass similar ordinances post Seattle. Uh, one thing we did um, coming out of that ordinance, uh, and especially after Trump passed his uh, uh, executive order that also gave the green light again for the Keystone XL pipeline, is we wanted to kind of get a jump start on um, not waiting until uh, construction began. Uh, on that pipeline or, uh, you know, we want to, to uh, try to stop it before uh, construction begins. So we, we drafted a, another uh, piece of legislation, went back to our city and what this um, uh, legislation called for was that if any uh, bank uh, were to give uh, loans to TransCanada uh, for the construction of Keystone and um, or other tar sands pipelines, then they would be um, unable to bid on any C city of Seattle contracts. So we kind of wanted to put their feet to the fire. And uh, again, before the pipelines are even built. Uh, one thing with that ordinance, uh, back to the Wells Fargo ordinance, we uh, crafted it as a socially responsible banking ordinance um, because we, we, we did that because we didn't think it would be a victory to simply have 
Seattle closed its accounts with Wells Fargo and then sh shift them over to like Bank of America or, or you know U.S. Bank, that wouldn't be a victory. So the socially responsible banking criteria uh, established a whole set of criteria that uh, if any bank is to bid on the city's uh, contracts, they would have to be adhering to these various policies. And there are things like not uh, funding uh, energy intensive fossil fuel projects like DAPL, not investing into private prisons, not engaging in um, predatory lending practices, stuff like that. So uh, that's all part of that ordinance. And we felt that would be a, a strong message in, in trying to uh, go after all the banks. You know, we didn't want, again, our money to just get sent to an another uh, Wall Street evil bank. So, um, so yeah, we, we had the Wells Fargo ordinance. We passed the, uh, uh, the legislation going after potential uh, tar sands pipelines. Uh, the next step we took after that, uh, a, a couple things. One, we're also going after the pension fund, uh, which is still in the works. Um, but we started targeting JP Morgan Chase, uh, who in the past has given uh, a number, uh, a, a lot of money to tar sands campaigns. And so in late March, we issued them a letter uh, stating that if they did not um, uh, come out with a statement opposing or stating that they would not give money to uh, fund the Keystone XL pipeline, then we begin a, a shutdown of JP Morgan Chase banks. And we fully knew that they weren't gonna you know, listen to us. So uh, we gave them a, a couple week deadline to respond. And of course they didn't. Um, so we uh, started shutting down uh, Chase Banks throughout uh, Seattle, and that's something that has continued on uh, since then. That also uh, coincided with that legislation stating, you know, letting them know, hey, Chase Bank, uh, you know, if you, you uh, give money to the uh, fund, construct these pipelines and you can't bid on the uh, city of Seattle contracts, and we'd had uh, Seattle City Council members involved with that process. All of this since then has kind of expanded into a broader uh, coalition, um, one of which we recently uh, launched uh, with ourselves, Last Real Indians, uh, Muzaska Talks, uh, the In Indigenous Environmental Network, Honor the Earth, uh, and um, the In International Indigenous Youth Council um, that is targeting the, the four pipelines uh, tar sands pipelines and so uh, our first action was to get um, we, we, we our, our coalition uh, along with other uh, other environmental groups went after a number of large NGOs who um, uh, released a joint statement um, just last week uh, we had 15 NGOs uh, stating that they're going to divest from uh, different banks. The 17 primary banks were funding both DAPL and all the four tar sands, um, proposed tar sands pipelines. And that, it was about $3 billion that uh, they're divesting. So uh, that's, I know it's kind of a lot, but uh, in, in five minutes, but you know, that's some of the stuff that we got going on in Seattle. We just sent a, a delegation. Yep, there it is. Uh, a delegation of uh, four water protectors uh, to Europe who did a three, four week tour of uh, seven, seven different uh, countries throughout Europe, uh, going to the banks, going to the UN, uh, calling on divestment and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of the current uh, state of uh, what we're doing out here. Um, I guess lastly, I'll just throw out there uh, to on Wednesday, uh, we're going back again to our, our city council for um, to, to try to push another piece of uh, legislation, which is to get the city to end all ties to Wall Street, period, and to uh, establish a publicly owned bank. Um, and then um, we, we'll get rid of, get, get our city out of uh, all those banks in one shot. So we're uh, going to, uh, seek a, a sponsor for for that public bank uh, later this week and uh, there are a number of other west coast cities uh, who are looking to do the same that we're in partnership with so that's uh, something uh, to be looking for 
Great, Matt. Thank you very much. All right. Um, sit tight and we'll bring up Victoria and then uh, and then uh, we'll have you back in a few minutes. All right, Victoria, give me just a second and I'll pull up your slides. Appreciate everybody's patience. It's a new, new webcast system today. Okay, there we go. And Victoria, I think you might be on mute. Maybe uh, I just took you off. Okay, great. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, thanks for sharing about your work, Matt. That was uh, very inspiring to listen to. Um, yeah, so I have been part of the um, student divestment movement uh, around the fossil fuel industry for the last four, four or so years. I started in college. Um, and have been coaching for the last couple of years and mostly work with the University of California uh, school system. It's a 10, camp, 10 campus uh, undergraduate school system. Uh, we have active campaigns on six of them. Um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the, the history of escalation with that campaign and what successes and wins we've had um, and, and some challenges and learnings. Um, but really, so what our students um, or looking to do and a lot of uh, students on university campuses have been doing for the last four or five years um, is trying to get their universities to divest from the fossil fuel industry. So the top 200 companies that are on um, the carbon tracker list, um, these are, you know, the companies that we feel are that uh, are most responsible for uh, the climate crisis. And students are really saying, we want to shift the conversation on climate. We're going to do so through organizing and through direct action. Um, our universities are the pillars of our, are some of the major pillars of our country and of our society. And if they say no to the fossil fuel industry, so must the federal government um, and other politicians. Um, and at the UC system, we have a, a 90 uh, billion, we have $90 billion that are pretty much up for grabs um, to be divested from the fossil fuel industry. And in the last uh, three years, the campaign has gotten coal and tar sands to be divested, about 200 million from that. And then in this last year, about 150 million um, from some DAPL companies. So Sunoco, or Sunoco Logistics and Ener Energy Transfer Partners. Um, but students know that actually the UC has about $3 billion invested in the fossil fuel industry. We've only divested about uh, 350 million. There's still much more to go. Um, and so last year, the students did a series of escalations um, at UC Berkeley. They did a sit-in inside of the uh, chief investment officer's office to urge uh, the UC system to divest. Um, and so this year we are building off of that, um, off of that momentum and came and came into the spring with a good escalation plan. So we had three different schools, um, escalate. And what I mean by escalation is basically it's a, it's sort of upping of your tactics. So doing things that are more intense than you've done before, whether that be in the number of people that you're bringing, the frequency of your of how often you're taking action in the risk of your action. Um, so sit-ins uh, are sometimes arrestable. Uh, you're often risking arrest if, if you decide to stay uh, beyond the um, beyond the the hours of the building. And so that is what uh, three of our schools chose to do this um, in a three-week period, which was very exciting. So it was a coordinated escalation. Right now here you're looking at uh, Santa Barbara. So they had 400 students over, four, over a four-day period sit in just at UCSB alone. Um, what happened was 
uh, a couple of weeks earlier, UC Berkeley students sat in at their campus, uh, about 20, about 50, sorry, um, two students were arrested. Um, Regent Sherman, who is our target, who can make the choice to divest, decided rather than to engage with students uh, in a dialogue that he would arrest two of our students. Um, that triggered, you can go back to that other one, Anne, actually. Yeah, so that triggered uh, UC Davis actually to sit in. They had um, about 100 students over the course of two days sit in and sleep over. They had about 40 students each night sleeping over in their chancellor's building uh, at UC Davis up in Northern California. And then the week after, um, if you go to the next one, then that one is the uh, UC Santa Barbara. And so they really culminated um, in this growing um, and increasing escalation uh, over the period of time, where in the end at UC Santa Barbara, they actually won, um, they actually won the support of their chancellor. So their chancellor, Chancellor Yang, came out in support and said, I support my students who are sitting in. Um, in their efforts to get the UC to divest from the fossil fuel industry, which is a really big deal because we hadn't gotten that before. All the chancellors, um, none had given public support. Um, and in the course of that week after he gave his public support, we got three more chancellors uh, from UC Davis, um, UC, Santa Bar or, sorry, UC uh, Santa Cruz, and UC San Diego. Um, all to come out and support and that was a huge that was a huge deal to have actually the chancellors who are basically the presidents of the each of each campus say out loud publicly that they support the full UC system divest from this is really something we haven't we haven't seen before at, at, on this um, on this campaign so that was really exciting um, yeah, and I'm just going to wrap up real quick um, and just say that it was really important that we chose a target and named him publicly. So we, a lot of our students were saying, you know, Richard Sherman, uh, he is the person that can uh, do, change the decision or have the decision to divest. That put a lot of pressure on one specific person. It turns up the heat and allow, it doesn't allow people to really um, kick it to different, to say, oh, it's not my, it's not my choice, you know. Um, I think also other other learnings were the escalations happened really quickly. They're planned about they're really planned months in advance, but um, the actual all the actual work that had to be done was really like within a month. So if you're feeling excited to do an escalation, just go for it. I really like encourage just action um, in general, not to get too bogged down in the planning. Though the planning is really important. Um, and the last couple of things were just that um, the students who did the best escalations just really desperately wanted the UC to divest. They um, talked to their friends, they recruited their friends, they were not shy about you know, what they wanted to do and um, weren't afraid of, of creating some of that conflict that happens when you go into a building and, and decide to sit down and, and not leave uh, until, until you get what you want. So. Yeah, and that's UC Davis again. They did a follow-up action um, after after uh, their reach after their chancellor um, supported divestment. And yeah, I'll end it there. Thanks, Sam. Great, Victoria. Thanks. Sit tight. All right, we're gonna bring Jamie in here. Okay, and give me just a sec. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I just want to say, hey, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here. And um, I want to thank Matt and Victoria for um, sharing about their work. Um, it's really inspiring to hear about and how we can all be learning together and working together and um, building together. Um, and should I just go ahead? Just one second. I, uh, for some reason, it, uh, yeah, you know what, go ahead and I will get your slides up here in just a second. I'm having okay. a little, little uh, problem here, but I'll figure it out. All right, so um, I work for um, Enlace. Um, Enlace founded the Prison Divestment Campaign in, um, in 2011 
to um, take on the shared roots of criminalization of black people, people of color, and immigrants, and to stop a driver of, um, of mass incarceration and immigration enforcement, namely the for-profit private prison industry, um, which spends millions on lobbying um, for increased incarceration and increased immigrant detention. Um, and so recognizing that like all of our cities and universities and pension funds are invested in private prisons and the banks that prop them up, um, unless we pressure them not to be, we have been um, leading uh, with university, city, um, pension divestment campaigns um, across the country for the last um, three years. So um, today I want to tell you about our recent Portland victory, Portland, Oregon victory, um, where in April we um, after a three-year campaign, um, pressured the city of Portland to stop investing in all corporations, um, including prison profiteers like Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and other companies like Caterpillar, which um, destroy the, the lives and lands of indigenous peoples um, from Standing Rock to Palestine. Um, so I really kind of just want to share some some like nuggets about like how we won this big victory because it's it's huge. Um, it's incredible to hear about um, the mass uh, momentum there is right now around divesting from Wells Fargo, which has been you know called out for its um, fraud, been called out for its funding of Dapple, and been called out for its ties to um, private prisons, and it's been called out for its like involvement um, in labor abuses and and everything else, but. Um, uh, hearing what Matt was saying earlier about how do we actually get to a place where we're cutting um, ties with between our cities um, and like Wall Street so that we're actually building community control is a really exciting place to be and exciting um, a visionary place to be with divestment. So um, in Portland, we won our victory um, by, by getting into the long fight. It was a three-year campaign and um, it required us to build a really strong and diverse coalition that recognized the different ways that um, private prison companies um, and criminalization um, impact our communities differently. So we built a powerful and diverse coalition um, representing 10,000 Portlanders from um, the immigrant, Black, Latino, um, labor, faith, civil rights, and LGBTQ communities. Um, we also developed um, the leadership of the people most impacted by corporate and state violence um, and built a movement for human rights here that targeted um, all corporate backers of human rights abuses. So we did that by community education events, actually um, doing outreach to, um, to the immigrant community, um, with our, our coalition partners, and they're also talking about um, uh, criminalization, anti-blackness, right, as a way to actually build like black and brown unity um, in the struggle for prison divestment. Um, we um, made sure that our strategy group was actually um, black and brown folks um, and most impacted folks only, um, and that um, white ally organizations were there to step up when needed, but that the strategy was actually being led by the people most impacted. Um, and organizations representing those, those groups. Um, and then we also um, took every opportunity the city gave us to um, take over community control. So um, this was a three-year campaign. It wasn't easy and there were the city roadblocks um, everywhere. Um, and so one of the things that the city propped up, which um, was actually um, pretty incredible, is a socially responsible investing committee. And we made sure that our people, um, people with our analysis and also um, people of color and people who have been most impacted by systems of criminalization um, were actually on that socially responsible investing committee. Um, and we won a human rights impact criteria because we developed leadership of people who had been um, held at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma um, and brought their stories um, and their voices to, to City Hall. And so that City Council was pressured to actually adopt a human rights framework um, within their investing policies, which to my knowledge is the first um, in the country and has been followed suit by, um, by Berkeley and some other cities. Um, within our three-year campaign, we had a lot of opportunities where we could have just been um, very narrow 
in what we decided to pursue. Um, but we refused to um, take on divide and conquer tactics that would have um, that would have only added a couple corporations to the city's divestment list. Um, you know, and so we decided that it wasn't worth it for us just to have Wells Fargo on that list, but that it was also important for us to be hand in hand um, with um, the boycott divest sanctions movement, which is uh, fighting for Palestinian rights and liberation, um, to have Caterpillar as a um, company that we were also asking for um, divestment from and to be really solid um, in working together around that. We, um, we also, you know, didn't just say like Wells Fargo is bad because of private prisons. It's like, no, like Wells Fargo is bad because of its involvement um, in uh, destroying uh, sacred lands and rights of indigenous peoples in the states um, and further abuse of labor. You know, like we, we were very intentional in, um, in building a broad analysis and vision of uh, what corporate and state violence look like and getting everyone on board with that. Um, and so um, in the end, we had built up a strong coalition uh, for prison divestment that included 25 organizations, but then we were reaching out into other coalition spaces with the Boycott Divest Sanctions Movement, uh, with the Defund DAPL Movement, with the Fossil Fuel Movement, and actually getting like, really solid around what all of our, um, the, the commonalities between our, our targets, um, recognizing that all of the 17 banks that um, are involved in the pipelines are also involved in private prison expansion. Um, and we can draw those connections and we're stronger when we draw those connections. Um, and we also, um, we also had a, a campaign that honed in on local connections. And so it was really easy for our city to be like, oh no, like this is an issue that's not directly impacting us. Um, there's no private prisons in Oregon we were able to uplift the fact that um, everyone that's picked up here um, for an immigration offense is sent to a private prison two hours away in the state of Washington. Um, and what does that mean for families here on the ground um, in the communities here um, and lifting up their, their voices and leadership and stories. Um, and because this was a three year campaign, um, we had the opportunity to um, flex our muscles and the leadership of um, most impacted communities um, in all of these different ways by taking on different targets that presented themselves at different times and growing our power collectively. So, um, you know, I already talked about the ways that we were intersectional, but we also um, were taking on private prisons and shifting power to community control on multiple fronts. Um, community control, you know, we were, we were taking that socially responsible investing committee that the city could have just felt filled with a bunch of white male bankers. Um, and we took that um, and we owned that. Um, and then we also um, were able to, with our collective power here from the city campaign, actually pressure um, Oregon Senator um, Ron Wyden to introduce legislation last year to um, end tax breaks for private prison companies as a way to try and and shut those companies down um, and at least make it so they're not getting as many tax subsidies for, uh, from us in the short term, right? And eventually totally um, abolish that industry. Um, where we're going next, um, we got in our, in our win uh, in April, we got um, a city commissioner to say that she's now looking into a feasibility study for a municipal bank. So we expect um, her to introduce a resolution on that. Um, any day now, hopefully um, this summer. Um, you know, and we see our Portland victory in terms of the prison divestment win, the intersectional divestment win really, um, and, um, and the municipal banking as um, what we can do as we're trying to actually build cities that are, are safe and liberatory for all of us in terms of um, economy, in terms of community control, um, in terms of um, building up this alternative vision, um, something that we're calling Freedom Cities, um, that actually is, uh, it builds up the world that we want to live in. So we see divestment as a, as a milestone and invitation into um, what we can actually accomplish through deeply intersectional organizing um, that works to um, uplift um, and center the people who've been most impacted by um, criminalization and oppression and make them safe and whole and all of our communities hold.
Great, Jamie, thank you very much. Sit tight. All right, everybody. I'll get faster at this. <laughs> okay. And Richard, we're going to bring you in here. Here we go. All right, let's see if we can do that. And let me just bring up your, um, your slides here. All right. Okay. So I can just jump into it. Yeah, thank you. It's an uh, honor to be here and sharing the space with other distinguished webinar guests. Um, so uh, I'll just take a few minutes to talk a little bit about fossil fuel divestment campaigns and kind of expanding upon um, uh, a little bit what Victoria said and what Matt said as well, um, and a little bit what Jamie said. So uh, I think that right now, particularly in the face of Trump pulling out of Paris and the regressive actions of the federal government and seeing who's in the federal government in the US, plus the rise of the right in different countries in the world, that uh, divestment campaigns are even more important than they were before, um, particularly when they're complemented by um, other climate justice and environmental justice campaigns that are targeting specific infrastructure projects or pushing for regulation or legislation at different levels of government. Um, when you, I think, bring those together, then we can begin to see change happen and change happen quite quickly. Um, kind of the theory behind uh, the fossil fuel divestment campaigns is similar to the theory behind some of the previous divestment campaigns, like the one that um, uh, took on the tobacco industry and really uh, wore down um, the influence of the tobacco industry, um, which was a contributing factor to dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to erode the pillars of support, which Victoria mentioned earlier, which is the, um, the societal acceptance of fossil fuel companies and the burning of infinite amounts of of carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. So that societal acceptance comes from fossil fuel companies being um, uh, connected to some of our more most important institutions uh, around the country and around the world. And when they continue to have uh, individuals and institutions and companies investing in them, their power remains. But as we uh, erode that power, these pillars of support begin to collapse. So as more banks and more universities and more cultural institutions start cutting their ties with the fossil fuel companies, their ability to get access to the halls of power will begin to decrease. And right now we're seeing kind of a, I think, like a last push by these companies and certainly with Rex Tillerson in, in the White House and Secretary of State, they're, they're going at it pretty hard. Um, but if you know if we're able to be successful with this campaign, these campaigns and others, then I think it's only a matter of time. We can go to the next slide. Um, so the divestment. Um, you can go to the next slide. And the divestment, the fossil fuel divestment campaign started in the United States um, several years ago. Quickly expanded uh, globally. And right, right around the world, we have uh, examples of active and very successful, successful fossil fuel divestment campaigns. So everywhere from uh, New York to South Africa to the UK, Australia, uh, Brazil, and Japan. And each of these campaigns has their own look and feel. Um, and they are, I would say, uh, culturally appropriate for um, the spaces and where they're, where they're taking place. So the tone of a camp of the fossil fuel divestment campaign in Japan is going to look different than a university campus in the heart of California, for example. 
um, which is very interesting from a movement building perspective. So you have this kind of a, um, a, a campaign that can be modified um, around the world to take into consideration how those, um, those different societies are set up and cultural norms. The success of the, of the fossil fuel camp, uh, divestment campaign globally is, is pretty significant. So we, at this point, we have about 730 institutions uh, with $5.4 trillion in assets who have made commitments to divest. And it really ranges uh, across the board across these institutions, which you see on your screen. So um, uh, universities, where I think the, the fossil fuel divestment campaign really launched out and really brought a lot of people in. It's a place where a lot of people were recruited into the divestment movement, and that's expanded since then. To focus on capital cities um, of countries like France and Germany and Denmark, uh, a, much, uh, a very quickly growing number of faith institutions um, which are beginning to divest. And we've got um, Buddhist and Muslim and Christian and Jewish, um, religions who are all represented by these faith institutions who have made commitments to divest. Uh, the medical trades are coming in and various medical associations have made commitments to divest and are actively, more actively speaking out uh, uh, in a political way around these issue, uh, this issues. And we're also seeing the rise of pension fund campaigns um, and, and getting reasonably uh, sizable pension funds to commit to some form of divestment, either coal or tar sands divestment, all the way up to full fossil fuel divestment. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to uh, focus on a couple of uh, different kinds of institutions that we're, that we're working on that are very different from each other. So part of the focus of some organizations and groups and individuals is on Kind of influential institutions who don't have necessarily a large fund associated with them or a large endowment associated with them, but from like a cultural standpoint, are are very influ influential and and symbolic. And when you're trying to shake the pillars of support by having these institutions make commitments around the investment, um, you can have a significant impact for the size of the institution. So that includes institutions like the Nobel Prize Foundation, where there's a very active campaign right now to get them to divest from fossil fuel companies. Um, last fall, there was success reached with the American Museum of Natural History, which is based in New York City and one of the most eminent museums in the, in the United States, if not the world, who uh, drastically cut their ties with fossil fuel companies and other types of iconic institutions like the Louvre and the and Riverside Church as well. When you, if you look at past campaigns like the tobacco divestment campaign, when tobacco companies got kicked out of museums and they got kicked out of magazine advertising, they got kicked out of sports events, that's what really opened the space, created the right environment for um, the uh, states um, and uh, federal governments to pursue the tobacco industry with these multi billion dollar lawsuits um, on behalf of victims of. Um, basically cigarettes. So, you know, the divestment movement is about creating space as well as shaking these, um, these pillars of support. The next slide. Also an interesting kind of twist on the fossil fuel divestment campaign is that um, not necessarily with a lot of campaign pressure, but businesses are also stepping up and divesting. And these are individual businesses or business associations who are realizing that the money that they have in the bank shouldn't be invested in fossil fuel companies. And it's significant not only because they are moving their money out of fossil fuel companies, but also because they are taking the next step beyond that, which is advocating for their peers to do this and advocating for other institutions who are in their operating jurisdiction to divest as well. So a good example of that is Amalgamated Bank, um, the, one of the smaller banks, largely based in New York, uh, made a divestment commitment last year and has now become more and more vocal around pushing um, jurisdictions like New York to divest their pension funds as well. Um, so an interesting kind of twist and evolution of divestment campaigns um, is happening right now. You even have Ben and Jerry's, which, you know, with the ice cream company, uh, now owned by Unilever, one of the largest corporations in the world, 
very active on social media, pushing um, for uh, climate justice, but also in particular pushing for divestment campaigns. And they were one of the early corporations to make a divestment commitment. Uh, you can go to the next slide around pension funds. So I think one of the kind of new, not new frontiers, but a frontier where we're seeing a lot of um, recent success is around uh, pension fights. And what's interesting around the pension fights that are happening around the world, besides the fact that these pension funds have huge amounts of money that are directly invested either in fossil fuel companies or in the projects that fossil fuel companies are uh, trying to build. Um, that's the size of those funds are really significant and as a result their influence is very significant but also um, the fact that these pension funds represent the, the the pensions of literally tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of workers in the United States and around the world is also significant because that that means there's a connection to millions and millions of people and when we're trying to create a movement and build a movement around climate justice having access to those people or having a, a tie to those folks, I think is really significant. So as a, you know, the New York City Pension Fund with this um, $180 billion in assets, if it were to move towards fossil fuel divestment, um, then that would be a connection with millions of workers in, in New York City. Um, just two more slides. Uh, and so we're beginning to see, you can go to the next slide, um, we're beginning to see the social pillars at least shaking, if not falling. Um, so one slide back. Uh, you've got lots of white dudes who are making comments about um, the threat that they're feeling from divestment and climate justice, environmental justice campaigns that are impacting the reputation of fossil fuel companies and affecting their ability to A, bring their products to market, um, a, a B, be able to build infrastructure uh, projects um, and do so in a timely fashion that makes sense from a financial standpoint. Um, and beginning to see an erosion of their power as well, which I think is really significant. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the question really becomes, you know, a, a question of time. How, slow, how quickly can we slow projects and reduce the influence of fossil fuel companies? to allow for new technologies and better investments to come to the forefront. And that brings us to reinvestment. There are basically two ways of, of reinvesting, if you wanted to put it in the most simple terms. Um, uh, you know, a pension fund who wants to get out of fossil fuel companies can just invest those billions of dollars into their existing assets. So just top up their investments in company X, Y, or Z, who's not a fossil fuel company. But the impact of that I don't think is as significant as some of the reinvestment work that many of the divestment campaigners are trying to do, which is to have that money taken out of fossil fuel companies and go back into something that um, is also helpful uh, for fighting climate change or supporting community development or equal access to um, good jobs, that sort of thing. So we're looking really at reinvestment that is impact investing. And so investing in energy efficiency projects that can have a return, uh, green loans, community solar, again, that have a return on that investment, which is so key for pension funds um, and other institutions. Investing in companies that are in charge of building retrofits, so making communities more livable and, um, and uh, smarter from an economic standpoint. And also investing in companies that are local. So, you know, if you have a billion dollars, you can kind of invest it offshore, or you can invest in a company that's building solar in New York State and installing solar in New York State, so creating those local jobs. In the end, there's a lot of dismantling that has to be done as well. Our, our kind of model of continuous growth as a way to prosperity, uh, you know, we, we know that that's not going to, that doesn't work. And so as part of this reinvesting, we also have to re-envision. We have to re-envision uh, economic systems that I think are a lot more local uh, and more community-driven and, th and that don't um, rely on hyper-profits um, to succeed. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great, Richard, thank you. All right, let's bring everybody back here. All right. 
points. And I think a lot of you were wisely self-muted. <laughs> so um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you're muted. Okay, great. We just need, yeah, there we go. And Richard, I think you might be still on mute. There we go. Okay, great. All right, everyone, thank you so much for that. Um, so um, to our audience, I'm going to ask uh, these folks a few questions, and then we want to open it up for your questions. So please go ahead and type them in um, in the question pane, and um, and uh, so that we'll be able to bring your questions in. Okay. Um, so my first uh, question has to do with this this nice last point that um, that Richard is making, and um, about this is going to, this really shows that we need such a huge overall economic change. And, um, and it needs to be more locally based, which I think also connects with the issue of, of divestment big and large, and that some people um, may feel like, oh, well, if I'm not in a huge pension fund, what difference does it make? You know, what, what bank I'm banking at, or yeah. um, where my small retirement fund is. And I wanted to give everybody the opportunity to talk about the um, the importance of thinking about divestment and reinvestment, whether you are in a big institution or an iconic institution um, or not. So um, does anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, sorry. I was sort of out loud agreeing. <laughs> I'm used to being on mute a lot. Um, yeah, no, I think the, first, the thing that resonated with me with what you were saying, Anne, is like, is people saying, you know, uh, oh, our pension fund is small. Oh, I'm like an individual. Oh, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's um, a lot to be said even about, you know, the University of California. There's like, there's $90 billion up for grabs on the table, but that the fossil fuel industry is one of the richest industries in the world. And really what we need to do is we need to show how many people symbolically both pension, both like institutions and individuals are, are not like standing for it anymore and are like pulling themselves out of being complicit with, with the system and are being those pillars um, that Richard was talking about, just, just pulling out. I really think like the, the frequency and like just the symbolicness is, is so, so important in of itself. Um, when the people, like when the people talk, the politicians have to have to listen. So that's what I that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in? I think um, Matt. I think it might have been on the Divest Apple page. There was even a like you could navigate for like individuals looking at divestment versus institutions, and um, which I thought was really great, just to encourage people um, as individuals to act. So um, wanted to see if you want to weigh in or. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, and I agree with with the past two two folks have said that uh, there's also something just to be said for you know uh, divesting your individual account that um, you you just feel like you're morally doing the right thing. So it don't matter how much or how little you have in your account. You know, uh, that's what we encouraged folks. Um, was that to, to close their accounts is that's probably the simplest thing that you can do. You know, not everybody can get out onto front lines. Not everybody could make it out to Standing Rock and, you know, do, do those, those, not everybody can make it down to city council meetings. But if you have a bank account, that's one thing you do have control over. Um, so uh, to, to get to uh, what you're talking about though, yeah, we, we created a, uh, through our, our Muzzle Scott Talks uh, homepage, uh, a kind of a step-by-step -step how to uh, both close your own individual account and uh, links to credit unions, uh, those sort of places, to, uh, better places to house your money, as well as a step-by-step -step guide on how you could get your city and or tribe uh, to uh, divest and uh, pass through socially responsible uh, banking policies. And now we're working on the step-by-step uh, -step on a uh, how to how to get your city or tribe to look into uh, establishing a, a publicly owned bank 
or a tribally owned bank. Because uh, ultimately, like I mentioned, you know, that's the direction we want to go is just to get our, our uh, funds out of Wall Street, uh, period. So you can check that out on uh, muzzascottalks.org. Uh, we got a kind of a guideline for how you can go about uh, doing, taking those steps. Okay, great. And I'll send, um, I'll send around links like that to everybody who's RSVP'd um, after the webcast, likely via, um, I'll, I'll set you up in MailChimp and, and, and send that out to everybody. I'll get links from the different presenters. Um, and um, I wanted to talk to you about this, this public bank issue has come up. Um, I'm really excited in Portland too. Um, and I'm interested if that's um, um, locally, that seems like a, a really great um direction that some municipalities are looking at and wanted to have folks talk about that and then um, also hear what people might be thinking about um, like in a larger scale Richard if there's sort of a more responsible <laughs> if it's possible to do it on larger scales a more responsible international monetary fund you know is that is that possible what would that look like hmm. <laughs> The, the the bigger the the bigger that you get, unfortunately, and I think the experience is, is that the a the more bureaucracy that you get, but also the less control you have over the types of investments that are made, and you know how just those funds may be. So, I think locally based solutions are um, make more sense, and they make more sense because they're they're locally based. They have the ability to kind of be aware of what's what the opportunities are on the ground um, right now there aren't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of great examples uh, for large institutions and each large institution has their own kind of uh, investment vehicles and way that they're set up so there's a little bit of like recreating the wheel that we're experiencing with large pension funds for example who are wanting to invest in um, in different products there's a lot of homework that they need to do. But they also have investment managers who are paid a lot of money and are quite smart. And I think with the right direction, can be told, you know, get out of fossil fuel companies, figure out something else that is going to work. Don't come back to us and say, well, we can't do it. That's, you know, we, we, need, we need the heads of pension funds to be able to kind of lay down the law and direct the investment managers, which they pay for. Um, to do the work necessary to find investments um, that make sense from like a local perspective, but also from a carbon footprint perspective as well. Um, yeah. And in terms of individuals, you know, it, it is sometimes complicated if you're invested in a, in a, if your pension is held within the fund, as opposed to just at a, at a bank and you're investing on your own. But there's a lot more products that are popping up every day um, you know, investment companies, large investment companies, including BlackRock, have vehicles that you can invest in that are fossil free because they recognize where, where things are going. There's, you know, and they want to get ahead of it and make money off of it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of options that have become available, particularly for individual investors. And is that happening for... Um for other areas too, like are um, investors able to offer prison-free funds? Are they able to offer um, uh, specific, yeah, are there other options? Are there, are you seeing things that are specifically about really controversial topics like, or, you know, pipeline projects and stuff? Are people seeing that from, uh, from funds, are they are fund managers calling you <laughs> and talking about this? Um, on the prison free funds, um, I'm not aware of very many. Um, uh, they might be out of direct prison investments, but we know that private prisons are able to expand, lobby, and um, diversify into um, commodifying reentry services and electronic monitoring because of their. Um, they're bankrolling by big banks, the same banks that are involved in um, funding uh, pipeline projects. Um, and so 
there's some growing awareness, but I think there's a lot of um, incentive to sort of pass the buck. It's like, well, you know, we'll get out of direct investments, but we are going to actually look a little bit deeper about what um, financial systems are allowing us to perpetuate. Um, but there is a really excellent resource, um, the AFSC Investigate um, tool to look into all of the companies that are involved in um, profiteering off the corrections industry as well as off um, the occupation of Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, and I would encourage folks to look at that. I know that they are actually working to later this year come up with a tool so you can see if your own mutual fund is actually invested um, just by putting the fund name um, to see if it's invested in those companies. Oh, wow. Great. That sounds like a great resource. Um, I'm going to give uh, folks the chance to weigh in on anything we've talked about so far. And then I have two, two uh, kind of strategy questions and then I'll, uh, and then I want to open it up. We've got some great questions coming in from the audience. Um, um, so I'm interested in how, how do people who are campaigning in um, in other issue areas, how would they be able to judge whether divestment would be um, a good tactic for them? How did you all know, or the campaigns that you're working with know, the power that would be there for the issues that you're working on? <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, divestment is a tactic we use when we want to abolish um, abolish an industry and abolish a system of oppression and we want to build up something new in its place. And so I think that's a common thread among um, all of the folks on um, here. I think also divestment is a tactic to consider um, if you want to mobilize uh, a lot of people. All these, all the divestment campaigns that we're talking about, the fossil fuel divestment campaigns, prison divestment campaigns, in particular infrastructure projects and defunding them or de divesting them. The divestment campaigns, I think, give an opportunity to make a connection with, with folks that people understand and uh, they understand quickly and easily and that helps with mobilization. And I think, you know, part of it is like removing the power of these industries, but part of it is also building out uh, a movement for justice and um, we have to do them at the same time and uh, divestment campaigns create that great opportunity for people power. Great. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the solidarity that is apparent in a lot of these campaigns, which is, which is really exciting. Solidarity across different issues, um, solidarity um, for indigenous communities, you know, non-indigenous allies seeming to use divestment as a, as a way to show their solidarity. And I'm just wanting to have our, have you all talk a little bit about um, how you see that, how you see that happening and what you think, why you think that's, tr that's true in divestment work. I, I know for us in Seattle it was really important to, um, to build that kind of broad based coalition. Uh, like I mentioned um, previously that we going into the divestment against Wells Fargo, you know, we understand like Wells Fargo is a, a bad player for many reasons, uh, not just because of their investment in uh, the code access pipeline and or other pipelines, but as, as everybody knows, their investments in private prisons and detention centers and stuff like that. So um, one, we just saw that as a uh, fertile ground for organizing, you know, the, obviously the, the, the more broad based coalition you can bring, uh, <clears throat> then uh, you're just going to be stronger. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, in, in, in bringing our message to uh, city councils and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's just important to also support one another's work. And, uh, you know, in, so what, one of the things we saw uh, post the ordinance vote uh, is in Seattle, folks that were working against uh, the quota access pipeline, um, because we built that partnership with uh, around divesting from uh, private prisons and detention centers uh, in Seattle, they were, they've been trying to build a, uh, a new youth detention center 
and we, we were able to see that you know the same banks were behind uh, wanting to build this new youth detention center, and uh, our we had communities organizing against it. So you know we're able to kind of go from uh, organizing uh, around one issue to the next. You know, so when they would hold their actions and rallies and stuff, we would turn out and support them, and uh, you know, and that's been largely successful uh, around the youth detention center because we've now got it to a point where uh, they're looking to pull back on the permits from uh, building a, a new youth prison. Um, it was mentioned, you know, that we, we have the Northwest Detention Center, which is just south of Seattle, uh, about 40 minutes south in uh, Tacoma. And so uh, the same thing when they've been holding uh, hunger strikes down there, we bring our coalition of uh, no dapple down uh, to uh, support their efforts, but I think it's also given an opportunity to to look at a lot of uh, different uh, uh, projects that are, you know, the whole West Coast is kind of like the new uh, uh, target for a lot of these uh, fossil fuel companies, whether for coal export terminals, uh, 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 LNG plants and stuff like that. And so we're able to look and find out, you know, uh, the, the common denominator behind a lot of these projects, whether they're prisons or fossil fuels, are these banks, you know, and so it gives us all a uh, a common target to to go after. So, yeah, I think it's been an effective strategy from that standpoint. It gives us a, a common uh, target to organize around. Great. Jamie, did you want to jump in and talk about that for Portland? Um, for Portland, the work here has been, um, I don't know if I have anything to add that's not for you to read what I said earlier, honestly. Okay, so. that's all right. And then um, just uh, Victoria or Richard, if you a uh, chance to jump in and then we'll bring in the, the questions. Um, I'm wondering about, you know, just across UC campuses, um, just, you know, you've got campuses each have their own culture and they each have issues that are prioritized and, um, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think to your first question around like why divestment is so, or like easy, it seems like an easy solidarity tactic. I think it was kind of what Richard was talking about, like, or uh, sorry, Matt, maybe um, everyone can do it there's like pretty much money everywhere that is being used in probably ways that it shouldn't be. Um, and so it's a really easy way for people to get engaged symbolically and just show, show their, show their support or their difference. Um, yeah, for the UCs, I think, and for your campuses in general, I know at Syracuse, um, there has been, so you, the UC system, basically like schools decided pretty much to unite around and ask because most of the UC uh, money they wanted to target was held by the regents. So this larger um, body, um, each campus did have their own like endowment, but often they invest it with, within the principles of what the UC regents set. And so, um, but like UC Berkeley has a, an endowment that is three, three, billion dollars they send two billion of it to the uc regents they keep one billion of it to be held privately uc students uh uc berkeley decided to after a couple of years of campaigning around the private one decided to target the the public one because um it was easier there are like 140 trustees on the private board um who aren't they don't meet in central places it's very hard to find out information from decided to public or target the more public um endowment that also like uh, we could tell a larger story around the whole UC system. Um, that's what really people care about. California is like the eighth largest economy in the world. And so when UC does something rather than when just a smaller or, you know, UC Berkeley uh, does something, it, uh, it just, it's much bigger impact, even though UC Berkeley is a very uh, renowned school. But in terms of solidarity across issues rather than even just uh, solidarity across campuses within, within the same campaign. We've seen at Syracuse, for example, which they did divest, they created a coalition across um, fossil fuel divestment and prison divestment. And I believe there was one other, but I'm not remembering exactly 
uh, all of the members represented. They did a huge dead end uh, that created a lot of power. And one of the concessions from that was fossil fuel divestment. So I think it's an interesting thing in their case for that campaign. That was, it seemed like that was the right thing to do to create that coalition. If you're in the prison uh, divestment campaign, though, you're, you're sad because that wasn't your thing was not the concession. Um, yeah, so I think it's like based on strategic um, considerations based on your campus climate, obviously. Um, yeah, and, and in those in those cases, that worked out. But yeah. Okay, great. All right, um, I'm going to bring in some folks from the audience. Hopefully, we've got Victoria D, who's um, asked a couple questions. Let me see what happens. Um, uh, Victoria, we are going to see if we can uh, if you're the first person we can promote to, uh... <laughs> all right, here we go. Tori, I hope you're gonna be here in a second. It says it's bringing you in. There we go. And if you wanna use, uh, looks like you're on mute. If you wanna use your um, webcam, you can, but we'd at least love to hear you. Looks like you should like we should be able to hear you. Maybe it's not working. Okay. Hold on, Victoria. I'm going to go ahead and ask a couple of your questions here. Has anyone had any experience with an investment company or financial corp that is working to help local municipalities divest and reinvest in local communities? Um, she's having trouble locating resources for their municipalities to reinvest. Um, Let's start start with that one. Anyone have any experience with investment companies that are working to help help with that? There's a really interesting company um, called Transform Finance. The website's transformfinance.org. And uh, they work with communities, but they also have a network that they've set up um, called the Transform Finance Investor Network. Basically, it's a network of investors who are looking to uh, reinvest or invest in um, community solutions, in um, you know, green infrastructure projects, green companies, that sort of thing. So that might be a first place to look and then possibly point um, I think the pension fund or cities that you're campaigning on to. Any other thoughts on that one? Okay, we have a question from uh, from Nancy Nancy Laurel. Let's see if we can bring you in here. Hi, Nancy. I think you might need to unmute. Okay. How's that? Can you hear me? Oh, a little bit. You might have to talk a little louder. Yeah, my my microphone isn't great. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're having a little trouble with your mic. So you've got, um, you are in, uh, invested in TIAA CREF and you, um, in their socially responsible fund and you're not impressed with it. Um, saw that it's got you in Wells Fargo and they're resistant to removing you, is what your question says, because of, they say you won't be so diversified. What do our, what does our panel recommend when people who, who think they're already invested socially responsibly, who took that step and, um, and are finding out it might not be might not be as good as it should be. Panelists, do you have any recommendations? I'm sure that comes up a fair amount for people. I would say, if I can jump in, I would say just keep fighting. You know, the fact that you insisted on getting out of Wells Fargo uh, and they followed through on that. Is a good sign. They are responsive, at least with some pushing. And um, you know, there. I don't. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of simple solutions where you can just say, "Hey, you know, get me out of this, and I can go into this, and everything's clean." We're in a very uh, evolving place, uh, at least from a fossil fuel divestment standpoint, in terms of what the options are available. Um, so I don't know if that gives you much comfort, but if you have the strength to keep fighting to clean up your fund and, and do so and probably know that you're not alone that there are others as well who are probably having the same 
issues with um, TIA craft. Um, yeah. I know that there's a couple of organizations who are quite focused on getting TIA to divest from uh, fossil fuel companies, uh, some of the banks, and also from um, uh, companies who are involved in deforestation as well. Uh, how do I? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> hang on, hang on, Nancy, Laura. I'll be able to, I'll be able to pull you out of it. Just hang tight for a second, okay? We've got, um, we have a couple more questions. Some I will get to the presenters afterwards. There's one that was asked anonymously that I thought might be a really interesting one to to close on. It's very big picture for everybody. Um, says, how can you conduct dis divestment reinvestment campaigns while we're remaining critical of the ideology of profit motive, which is the root cause of why these campaigns are necessary in the first place? And I just want to invite any panelists who want to to weigh in on that. Yeah, um, first thing that comes to me is in your narrative. Um, yeah, the things that we said a lot in our divestment campaign were that uh, you know, the fossil fuel industry is putting people over profit. You can really speak well, I think, to uh, that a lot of the motivation behind the crises that we're facing is, is greed and, um, and people trying to pad their pockets, basically the few over the many. Um, so I think if you believe, yeah, if you believe that and you want to remain critical of it, I think you can do that like within yourself and also keep running campaigns and also uh, can do that in your narrative around your campaign as well. But I think the, if you, if you decide that those campaigns are worth running and include that in your narrative, we don't want to undermine your campaign uh, with, with sort of like ideological um, things that might confuse uh, either the public or, or the target them, themselves. Um, something that comes to mind for me is thinking about um, uh, not necessarily offering reinvestment alternatives in uh, the typical uh, options, not saying that it's okay to just invest in another company because we know that most of the companies that are really big, especially for city investments or bigger pension investments, like might uh, are very likely not um, ethical in some way or another. Um, and so I'm really inspired by the story of um, the CSU LA, the California State University, Los Angeles um, divestment work where um, black led student organizing pressured the university to divest from prisons and um, to do concrete reinvestments in black students and students of color um, in terms of uh, recruitment and retention, um, like a, a black only dorm, um, uh, psychological services, like all counseling um, and, uh, and educational counseling. So other forms of commitment that actually wind up um, seeking to reinvest wealth in communities that have been most impacted by um, our disastrous and extractive economy um, in ways that don't necessarily get the same return um, that we, um, that our cities and pensions and invest uh, expect, and we can push them to expect something different. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Or any other um, closing thoughts before um, we're going to um, let the audience go and then I have just a couple last questions for any panelists who can who can stay on. But any last um, thoughts for the audience before we close down this part? I would just share that uh, we look at divestment as just a tool in our toolbox and uh, of strategies we can utilize uh, in uh, going, whatever the campaign is, you know, whether it's addressing the pipelines or, or uh, prisons and stuff like that, that um, I think sometimes some of our movements, uh, we get kind of stuck in thinking there is uh, just one way of going about uh, addressing whatever the issue it is, whether it's via the courts or, you know, a direct action or uh, just doing, uh, uh, you know, going one particular route. And I think that's, uh, we need to embrace all a variety of these strategies. And that's uh, the kind of message we put out, you know, this is just 
a tool that we can utilize, you know, go after the banks, go after money. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop uh, doing direct actions. That doesn't mean we're going to stop uh, using, utilizing other uh, methods for uh, seeking the change that uh, we're, we're looking for. So just, you know, throwing that out there, you know, look at it as a, a tool to put in your, in your uh, organizing toolbox. Great. Anyone else want to jump in? All right. I want to thank all of our panelists so much, Matt, Victoria, Jamie, Richard. Thank you so much for being here and our audience.